anyways, it's time to get started. So uh, welcome to course that is entitled as a simulation of a mechatronic machine. Simulation of mechatronic machine. That's what we're going to speak next um, 14 weeks. And uh, my name is Aki Mikola. I'm going to be your professor and I will deliver all the lectures. And um, if there's any difficulties, any practical difficulties or any other things that you need to discuss regarding the course, I'm your contact person. And uh, here are the other students, excuse me, the teachers that are involved in this course. So in addition to me, there are two guys that are helping me what comes to their weekly assignments and others. And these two individuals that are helping me are Suraj and Alexander. Suraj and Alexander's uh, contact information can be seen here. So if you wanted to write to these guys, this will be the way to go. You see my face. This is, you know, Aki. But uh, Suraj and uh, Alexander can be seen here. So here is a Suraj. And here's Alexander with his really nice bike. I don't know where the, the Alexander is riding here in this picture, but it looks looks nice. It looks really nice. So three of us will take care of the discourse. And I see that there's a quite a bit of comments in that window. So some of you are complaining that you are still unable to log into Socrative. So if you don't know your student ID number, please go and log in to CISO system and check what's your student ID number and log in to system by not using the zeros in the beginning. OK, we will get back to that a bit later today. But anyways, so I see that I'm plucking a view a little bit, but um, you can see all the in necessary information. So first lecture, um, what I would like to do today is that I would like to get started from the ground rules. Ground rules are extremely important. You need to know what I'm expecting you to do to pass this course. And um, this is going to take you quite a while to explain all the details related to ground rules. But once we're done with that, then I have a short introduction about the subject matter of simulation of a mechatronic machine. That's uh, only going to take me uh, 15 minutes or so to do the introduction. And the purpose of the introduction is to, to answer you why. Why it makes sense to participate in this course. Like what is um, something that I'm expecting you to learn from this course. And once we're done with the introduction, then the real deal with, will get started. I have a little bit of information about the mathematics that is needed in the course. Not much really, but something that I would like you to be aware of. And then we will get started. The first thing that we will get started is a de description of rigid bodies. That's going to be something that is already um, not challenging, but something that is definitely um, important you to follow to in order to to make sense that I mean make sure that later you understand the subject matters that we will discuss. And let me see. There is a more comments. Now I'm not sure what these comments are about. Anyway, so let me continue with my explanations. These uh, lectures from one to six are pretty much dealing with the modeling of me mechanical components. And um, you know, as soon as we are ready with the description of rigid bodies, then we're discussing about the kinematics, kinematics issues, something that are important to, to run or it are important in able to be able to create the equation of motion. And it's roughly this where we're going to leave the kinematics and we're going to start about discussing about the dynamics. So from this on is all about the kinematics. From that down is all about dynamics. What is the difference between the kinematics and dynamics? That's something that I will explain to you perhaps not this week, but next week. That's something that is fundamentally completely different, and it's very important you to understand the difference between those two things. Then uh, there's going to be a um, midterm exam, and after midterm exam, we will continue with the following topics. 
So we will uh, continue to discuss about the equation of motion. We speak in a little bit about the flexible bodies and then a little bit about the hydraulics and um, then the real-time simulation games, game technology is shortly mentioned here. Then the summary is going to be here and future perspectives. Okay, so that's what's going to happen in this course. And uh, now comes the, the packets of practical information. The first important thing is that I am planning to have all the lectures this time of the week, meaning on Wednesdays at 4.15 to roughly 6 o'clock. And I know that the, when you log into um, this uh, time edit tool that is available in uh, in LUT internal website, it is actually providing the different times and even sometimes different days for my lectures. But um, because my lectures will be streamed, and at least in this first period, there is no face-to-face -face lectures whatsoever. I'm hoping that this arrangement is okay to you. And uh, it's been asked a number of times during this week whether or not these recordings, I mean, streamings are later available as a recordings, and they are, of course, available as a recordings, and you can find them in this YouTube channel. This YouTube channel actually is something that uh, is important to take a look, and I, I recommend you to subscribe that uh, YouTube channel because then it sends you an alarm whenever I'm streaming and send you a kind of like information that now it will be a good idea to, to open the YouTube and see what's going on. If you look into this YouTube channel, you will also recognize that there are lectures available from last year. And it's okay to watch those uh, recordings if that's what you want. And it's actually something that I even recommend you to do because there may be some hints to you regarding the in-class quizzes. So go ahead and do it. I'm going to use a playlist such the way that all the, the recordings from the 2020 will be placed to one um, uh, playlist, whereas the recordings from this year will be another playlist. So it should be okay to watch uh, both years. I mean, that you shouldn't be able to mix these uh, two years, but we'll see how well it goes. And then something that I'm completely blocking, so let me move a little bit. So you see that there's a question and answer session in Teams right after lectures at 6 o'clock, roughly 6 o'clock. Check your inbox. I emailed you through the Moodle, and you should have the link. And I did that because um, um, I didn't want to send you a calendar invitation because if I would do that, you would see the other participants of this course uh, that um, something that is a little bit inconvenient. So that's how it goes. So uh, let me see what are the chat comments here so far. I guess that you guys are still discussing about how is it you can lock into Socrative. Okay, that's how it seems to be. Is there anything else this time? No. Okay, so the lecture is on Wednesdays. How is this sounds to you? Is this okay to you? Can you live with this arrangement? I guess that all the comments are still related to uh, Socrative. But uh, please use a chat window if you have something strongly against this organization. Sounds okay. Let's move then. Tutorials. Uh, stay tuned. There will be more information available from Surats, and something that is something that is good you to keep in mind that there is not going to be any kind of tutorials this week. They will get uh, started in uh, week 37, which is next week. So information sometimes later this week, beginning of next week at latest. Um, Okay, so then there is a one comment. Let me let me read this comment. Yeah, always the lecture will be this time. So always Wednesdays from uh, four fifteen to six o'clock. Yeah, and I know that you know sometimes they are placed in a Tuesday, sometimes they are placed on Wednesday mornings, and so on and so forth. 
I'm still thinking to have them on uh, Wednesday afternoons this time. And again, you know, it doesn't really make much of a difference if you are unable to see the streaming because you can later watch the recording. The only thing that I have to admit there is a little bit of inconvenient to you if you are unable to follow the streaming is that then you cannot participate in class quizzes. That's the only problem. Other than that, I'd see no difficulties whatsoever. Okay, so um, what are these tutorials? Guided tutorials? Um, oh yeah, what, what about the guided, guided tutorials? Are there uh, videos available? Yeah, there's a plenty of videos available, which uh, Suras will explain the details to you. Let me see, there's one more comment. Okay, there's another class which is principle of industrial something from two to six course that is as well. Okay, that's all right, because you can watch this recording anytime you want. Wednesday is the same time, I understand. But uh, two of you that say that you have the uh, a little bit of conflict in your calendar, can you still live with this arrangement or is this too difficult for you? From two to six, yeah, from two to six there, uh, there's another course which is uh, entitled something like a principle of industrial something. But still, even though, can you live with the recordings if you aren't able to participate in um, the streaming? Okay, I will give you some time to answer that. So while you're thinking about that, let me show you something else. So uh, tutorials, there will be a total of uh, 12 weeks of tutorials. First tutorial will get started next week. It's difficult, okay. So uh, what about if you're watching the recordings whatever time you want? Is it still difficult for you to do or you just can't live with that? Okay, so it's um, one time, I'm a little bit lost. So you, you see somebody saying that is a one, once look like there's a one class only about that principle of industrial something and is recorded. Okay, I don't, I'm not sure if I follow you guys. Let's discuss about the practical matters after a little while and in a team so later in the, today's lecture. But anyways, uh, 12 weeks of tutorials, seven guided modeling tasks, which are not mandatory you to do, but they help you to do the simulation work, simulation like homework that will be explained a bit later. Weeks um, 45 to 48 will be used to complete the simulation work with the help of Alexander and Surat. So and in order to to follow the explanation of Suras and Alexander, it is highly recommended that you do the seven guided modeling task before you jumping into this complete, I mean, the simulation work. That's uh, my recommendation. Using the software that is called Simscape, it's the part of the MATLAB package. So you can um, use it with the university license or it operates under the university license so you should all have an access to it. And uh, you can already start familiarizing yourself with Simscape software. And the best way to do so is that you subscribe Surat's uh, channel. Surat's, here's Surat's um, face again. And I guess that you can find his channel if you just type his name. That I'm sure that's the way to go. Okay, previous knowledge. No previous knowledge is really required. So I don't expect you to know much about the dynamics. I don't expect you to know much about the mathematics. They help, they of course help, but those are not you know, mandatory requirements. One thing that is mandatory requirements, however, is that you have to have this can-do attitude. Why is that? That's simply because, you know, if you look at the subject matters that we're gonna discuss later, 
in this course they are like virtual displacement virtual work and such they are very difficult concepts and uh, you have to have this self high self-confident otherwise you simply cannot learn these subject matters they are clearly doable but you have to commit yourself to to work with this and i know that there are students that um, haven't been in the classes for a while, like those Jedi students and, and other students uh, from the field of uh, electrical engineering. Still, you can do it. So it's still not going to be too difficult to deal with this course, you know, because we're going to go with the, all the fundamentals we, and we go slowly. So it's no worries. But still, can do attitude definitely helps. Definitely it helps. We were where we were uh, here. Okay, can do attitude. And that's why, you know, there is a picture of Elvis here. Elvis as a character is uh, maybe the most important person for us. So it's not Lacroix, so it's not like Delampere, that is some, somebody that is really important for us, but it's Elvis. And why is Elvis? Well, that's of course because of the can do attitude. Elvis, good example about can do attitude. I'm another good example of that too. But let me check what are the comments in my chat window. <clears throat> yeah, so it's okay. So you guys are just unable to do the in-class quizzes and that's about it. And those are not important, not important. I'm going to explain these uh, in-class quizzes to you in this class, excuse me, in this slide. Okay, so here are something that you must know very much in detail. So here is an equation for you that tells how is your final grade will be computed. And I know that you guys are not interested about the final grade because you do this because you love the simulation stuff and you love the mathematics and so on and so forth. Still, let's take a look like how the final grading is computed. I have here two mandatory items. So you must do them. There is no way that you can skip them. And these mandatory items are written exam. Let's take a look at what is a written exam in the following slides. And simulation work. Those are the two things you must do. Then there is a supplementary tasks that you may do or may skip. That's up to you. And these supplementary tasks are weekly homework and in-class quizzes. What is this weekly homework and what is in-class quiz? That's some again about to explain you in the slides that are about to come next. Look, there is something interesting here, something that I would like you to pay attention to this, because if you look at the how is this components, you know, the written exam is graded from zero to five. Zero means failed, you didn't make it. And because this is mandatory, you really didn't make it, so you need to redo the written exam and you can redo it. So it's not like you're gonna die, but it's gonna be something that you need to take into account. And I got like something in my computer was like restarting or, no, it looks so oh, still okay. All right, so uh, that was uh, from zero to five. Simulation work, minus one to one. Weekly homework, zero to 0 0.25. In class quizzes, 0 to 0 0.25. So let's do the math. Let's think of that like a hypothetically, you are a really outstanding student. You're the best students ever. And you're scoring from a written exam, you're gonna score a five. Sorry, I'm writing with my with my finger because I lost my my pen during the summer. Then uh, simulation work you can get one and then weekly homework is going to be 0 0.25 plus 0 0.25 okay so that's uh you put these together that's going to be 0 0.5 you put these together that's going to be 6.5 uh, that's fine and everything is of course rounded up so you get seven which you don't because you know, the maximum number is, of course, five. And uh, keep this in your mind. And think about it, how is that you can um, 
minimize your work effort and maximize your grade. And if you feel that you know the best way to maximize my maximize my grade is by doing weekly homework and in-class quizzes, do it. And if that's something that is not fitting to your schedule or you really don't like this thing, skip it. It's okay. Or you know uh, if you you know want to do really good work in the simulation work, that sounds good too. But keep in mind that you know that five is a maximum that you can get from the all the courses. I mean, this is not just this course, but all the courses in LUT. And you have this opportunity to do seven. And if I see somebody to do seven out of five, I'm gonna dis I will be disappointed. And I will be disappointed because then you guys are not following something that is very important for us. Something that is very important for us is the principle of minimum energy. You can learn the details a bit later, but principle of minimum energy that means that don't overdo it but do the work that is needed for the grade that makes you happy and also keep in mind that five out of five you get five out of five you can easily get the nickname of having of nerd there's a risk so if you're scoring like a three out of five four out of five that's okay too then you consider it as a you know, good student, not overdoing things. So that's, uh, that's my recommendation. But this slide, extremely important. And make sure that you understand that I'm, you have to do the written exam, you have to do the simulation work. Those are the mandatory items. Okay. And I see no comments, so it seems that maybe you guys are agreeing with me. Written exam. Okay, so there is two online mid examinations, and they are really online. So those will be carried on in a modal database, and uh, they will be organized in a week 43 and week 51. And um, 43 and 51, that means they are available for a full week. And two exams and you have two attempts for each exam. So you can do the first exam in the very beginning of the week uh, 43, and second exam, I mean, second attempt a bit later in the same week, same holds for the uh, exam that is in week, in week uh, 51. So two attempts and online things. So that's the recommended, really highly recommended way to do this written part of the course. There's also these paper exams available, but don't do this because I can guarantee you that if you participate in these written exams, they are difficult. I really want to make your life miserable if you decided to go this final examination, written examination. And the, the reason is that um, it's quite a bit of work for me to read your handwriting and try to figure out whether or not you have any understanding about this subject matter. It makes me feel angry. And when I'm angry, Maybe I'm not one. I don't want to treat you in a fair way. Another thing that is good to keep in mind is that, you know, this first written exam is okay in terms of level of difficulty. Second is already very, very challenging, and the last one is so difficult that I would have a hard time to pass that exam by myself. So keep that in your mind too. Okay, and I see that there is a comment. Oh yeah, yeah. There is a yeah. That's a good comment. So. If, Seven out of uh, five is a, is a Tesla-related thing. Good comment. Thank you. Simulation work. This will be done individually, meaning that there will be student-specific initial values, and uh, those will be provided to you in a week 44. Uh, this will be created as OK minus, OK, and OK plus, and this is how they will affect your final grading. If you do this in a unacceptable way, in a way that we feel that this is um, substandard, then you can fail the entire course. So you need to make this seriously too. Okay, weekly homework, there will be a total of um, 19 points available from 13 different tasks. And I'm not expecting you to do the, all the homework or weekly homework, but if you do some of them, then I will give you this extra 0 0.25 points. So even if you skipped some of them, no worries. And don't let me know that you skipped some of them.
because every now and then there's a like a email correspondence that is not needed. So if you cannot make your way to a, to let's say to a lecture, fine, keep that in your private information. Same holds for the weekly homework. So if you're unable to do it, fine, don't do it. And again, it doesn't make much of a difference because it's just a part of the creating. So it's not that you're gonna die or anything like that. Here are, and then weekly homeworks will be available right after lecture. So I'm gonna release uh, first uh, weekly homework right after today's lecture. And then you will have, um, we're gonna have time to answer that. So you need to submit it that using the Moodle database. And the deadline is gonna be not this week, Sunday, but next week, Sunday, whatever day that is. I think it is that's, uh, I'm not gonna check my calendar, but it's, you can do the math and you can check what day that is. Okay, in class quizzes, a total of 24 points. And these are the weeks that I'm organizing the in class quizzes. And you know, you already know how it's a soccer team, so you know how to enter your answers. And again, again, I'm not expecting you to do this completely, but if you can do some of the, the in class quizzes correctly, then you can get that extra 0 0.25 points. And if you can do 16 out of 24, 16 out of 24, not bad, then you will get these extra points. Okay, how that sounds? I guess sounds okay. Okay, material. Material that is available, take a look at the Moodle side. This is something that is really important you to follow because Weekly homeworks and everything will be available through that Moodle site. And let me show that to you briefly. So let me put this visible. Oh, this is an in-class quiz, which I don't want to show you. But here is our uh, this, uh, Moodle site, of course, Moodle site. So these are the materials that you can find in the you know, first page. There's a lecture notes, which is highly recommended you to, to read as frequently as you can. Then they get started from this part, which is a part one. Then there is a lecture note, which is actually in Finnish, which is not recommended you to use because this is really old. And I'm sure there's like million typing mistakes and everything. So um, avoid this. This is a link for YouTube channel, pre-recorded material, which is highly recommend you to follow. There's a site that explains about this, something that I'm, that that is making it easy to learn about how is a simulation and what are the components needed in simulation, so on and so forth. Then there is a mathematics needed in the course. This is uh, basically a collection of links for a Khan's Academy, and it helps you to understand, you know, uh, the mathematics that I'm about to explain to you. Then there is my bio. So if you want to learn about my background, click this video, say for Surat's. Then you can uh, introduce improvement proposals considering the lecture notes. If you see a typing mistake, let me know it. And the easiest way to let me know it is by clicking this feedback section. Instant feedback, something that you're, if you're very unhappy about something that I do, my lecturing style or something that you hate big time, let me know it, let me know it. And you can do that without letting me know your name. So you can be really rough. So if you really hate this, you can send this without, you know, letting me know your contact information. And honestly, there is no way to me to know your contact information. So feel free. And then um, that's about it. Here's a period, first period, first topic. And this is pretty much uh, empty at the moment, but I'm gonna release this information later today. And if not today, then early tomorrow morning. Okay. This is the YouTube site that is about these uh, pre-recordings. So you can find it by typing this chemical. There is a playlist, which is a simulation of mechatronic machine like this course. Look at this. This is, out, this is really outstanding material, really awesome material. And uh, that's about it. I guess there's nothing else. Okay, let's hide this one. Now let's go back here. All right, so this is a link for the Temeco site, some guidelines. This is what I already mentioned. So concept that I'm about to explain you are difficult. Let's just face it. They are not easy. 
They are not easy, but they are doable. You can make it. And the way you can make it is that you trust yourself. You can make this. But that's not enough. You still need to work. And you need to work hard. And you need to follow the lectures, read the handouts, that, that notes that I mentioned earlier in the Moodle website every week. Do it every week. And I cannot emphasize how important is this. And that's simply because things getting progressively more difficult. We're getting started slowly. And you may like wonder, like, oh my God, this is so simple that it makes no sense. And then suddenly things becomes to be more and more difficult. And now if you skip one week and you come back to see my lectures, you will be completely off. You have no idea what's going on here. So that's why every week I need you to follow my lectures and I need you to follow my material. If you can do it every day, that's even better, way better. Do exercises and do everything by yourself. There is this plagiarism that is a serious crime. Don't do that. Because there are only few things that are never, ever going away from your life. If you do a murder or a plagiarism, they can always hunt you. They can hunt you for the rest of your life. Don't do that. And don't do it because it really helps you to prepare yourself to read an exam, which we will get back to those stuff a bit later. But my first in class quiz is this. How is that you can pass the course? And let me go away from the text. So how one can pass this course? And the options are by having a can-do attitude. Let me explain something before you enter your answer. Let me read the options and then I will explain something important to you. Then by following the lectures and not the material every week or every day and doing the in-class quizzes. By doing the exam and simulation work in an acceptable way. By doing all weekly assignments. Now, click the one that is a mandatory item. The mandatory item is a correct answer. So now you can cast your vote. This is not voting. You can enter your answer. Okay. And I will take a look how is that you're doing in uh, Socrative. And that's going to be available here. Oh, not here, but um, here. So I have uh, 64 logins to Socrative Systems. I can see that I have 70 views at the moment, which worries me a little bit because I supposed to have like 150 something views this time. But um, hopefully you follow the recordings afterwards. And um, now it looked like almost all of you that are watching this recording, you are able to log into Socrative. It seems that only five of you are unable to do so. And again, you know, look at the chat window. There are good advices how is that you can lock into the circulative system. So um, please follow that. And then select the one that you felt that is a mandatory item. So don't select something that is good to have it, but the mandatory one. And uh, momentarily, I'm going to release the correct answer. This already affects your final grading, because if you can get this correctly. That is 50 more correct answers to go, and then you will get this one extra 0 0.25 points. Okay. Another thing that I really like to do during this streaming is that I usually wanted to set the competition or game about the success rate. So what do you guys think that the success rate is today? Then you can enter your answer by using that um, chat window. And that's a percentage. Like what percentage of all the participants that we again have 65 participants? I know each of you actually entered this already. Oh, the room name is LUT. So you can see it here, room LUT. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, you cannot see that because I'm blocking the view using this. Here is a LUT. So let's wait that the last ones are able to lock in. Okay, and then the game is on. Game is on. So uh, so the first case is uh, 90%. Why not 100%? Should be 100%. This is have, guys, this have to be 100%. You know, yeah, no, 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 I don't believe you. Like in 90, 90, no, no, it's a, uh, 
you know, my guess is this, 100%. 100%. Definitely 100%. Here. Yeah. All right, others are, you know, there's as low as 65. Like 65 is ridiculous. It is low number. It should not be 30. Well, yeah, it's statistically it's roughly that much, but it should be more, should be more. Okay, so um, you guys ready to see, did you already cast your lottery? I guess that you did. So let me take this back. Here it is. And now I just need to see where is this window located. So it's here. Okay, yeah, uh, 67 answers and the, the success rate is 73. Okay, that's, uh, okay, I have good news. That's high percentage. It's a very high percentage, but um, it could be higher than that. It could be a little higher than that. And maybe some of you were selecting number of choices, but this time I was asking like mandatory item, mandatory item. A mandatory item this time is uh, by doing exam and simulation work. Rest improves the final grading, but they alone is not enough. Okay, then there is a comment about... Uh... <laughs> okay, so... Uh... That's a good point. So there's a, it makes no point to do the in-class quizzes if you are planning to skip the weekly homework. Weekly homework is something that goes hand by hand. So. I mean, uh, in-class quizzes and weekly homework, if you started to do one, you should do another one too, because otherwise it's a little bit of waste of time and energy. Good point, good point, good point. All right, so uh, we're here. All right, so let's uh, take a look at the introduction. And uh, once I'm done with the introduction, then um, we're gonna move on to mathematics and uh, description of rigid bodies. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So this is still plucking the view. So let me take it off. So introduction is next. Introduction. What is an objective of the course? Why is a good investment from your end to participate in this course? And what is that I'm expecting you to learn? Then we're going to a little bit discuss about the more details about this subject matter. So I'm going to explain you roughly or giving you a big picture of what the simulation means, what the simulation stands for. And a uh, little bit about how is that you can build the simulation model and what are the advantages of simulation in bigger picture. And um, of course, here when we're speaking about the simulation, we are speaking about simulation of a dynamic system. That's pretty much what I'm implying when I'm saying simulation. And of course, I should be more specific, but I'm sure you guys understand that. Okay, so objective of the course is learn the theories and techniques that are generally used in, dynam in the simulation of dynamic systems. Okay, this comes with um, bad news. And bad news is this, theories, techniques. So it's like it says here, like it reads here, so it's, theory. So this course is somewhat painful because we really are looking at the, what is a theory behind the simulation. And I'm expecting you to do that because you are a master level student. And for a master level student, it's not enough to know a commercial software, let's say Simscape as an example, and then being able to click the right kind of icons and building the model. But I'm expecting you to understand what's the theory behind Simscape and what's the theory behind of other simulation software. That's what I'm expecting you to do. Why that is important then? Because that will be the way to ensure that you are having the proper use of the software. So once you understand the theory, then you know how to use that in a proper way. So that's what I'm aiming here. Then um, some other bullets here. I'm hoping you to understand the potential of computer simulation in product development processes and not just in the product development processes, but all the product processes. So we're going to have an extension to other matters, like uh, we even discuss about uh, the manufacturing simulation and others. So that's another thing that I'm hoping you to understand. So 
simulation or potential of simulation in different product processes, including product development. That's another thing. I understand the sim uh, relationship between the computer simulation and reality. And um, that's important. That's extremely important. I want to also teach you something that is a critical thinking against simulation. And uh, that's needed because there is a medical condition called simulation disease. Uh, that's a severe medical condition. Uh, there is no medication. There is no hope if you got the, this uh, simulation disease. Simulation disease means that you stop thinking. You are letting your brains fade away. And every single thing you do is based on simulation. And that's not the purpose here. Simulation is completely different. It's actually stimulating your brains. That's the purpose, not letting your brains to, to die. And uh, final thing here is that I'm hoping you to also to learn how to use the simulation tools. That's the final item. And what we're doing in this course is that we are looking at the dynamic systems. We're sp mainly speaking about machinery just shortly about the biomechanical system, but uh, heavy machinery mostly. So we're looking at the, um, how is that the heavy machinery operates. And we learn a little bit about how to model the mechanical components, right, uh, like this box that is red in color. But more important than just the mechanical components, we need to learn about how are the actuator models and how we can assemble those different disciplines together. Because in real, machines, they are coupled together, they are assembled together, and it makes not that much of a sense to look at just the actuators in, let's say, in a crane like this. Another way around is not making much of a sense to look at just the mechanical components and guessing how much forces the hydraulic actuators are capable to produce. Here, we want to look at this as an assembled entity, and that's what I'm emphasizing in this course. We really don't have that much time to look at the control systems, but I'm hoping that you can combine information from other courses and then you can put something in this box. And we will definitely discuss about that. So that's another important point of view. Now I know that it's uh, almost five o'clock. So I don't know how you guys would like to organize today's lecture and lectures that are about to come. Should we have a break this time, or you really don't care about the breaks? Now you can use a chat window to let me know your thoughts. Okay, and then uh, <laughs> I, I like that. I like your comments. Okay, but uh, let me know if you want to have a break. I know that there's a little bit annoying that there's a quite a bit of delay, but I'm saying something, it takes like a 15 seconds or so that before you hear me. So it's not exactly real time streaming, but close to it. But the question again is that, uh, would you like to have her a break? That's yes or no. Okay, you guys, Okay, so I got, would be nice to have a break and another uh, that, um, you know, not needed. Five minutes, okay, I am with you. So I'm waiting for five minutes. So let me close this introduction. And once I'm done with the introduction, then we're going to have a five minutes uh, break. So just that you can reload your coffee cup. So you can refill it. Okay, so... um. Yeah, five minutes is not going to be too uh, too much. I know you guys have other things to do. This is getting late, but um, five minutes. Okay, what the simulation means of, and what the simulation of dynamic systems means. Basically, what we're doing here is something that you definitely know in advance. So we're basically using the well-known laws of physics. Newton's second law is a good example. Uh, this is, by the way, what we're going to use when we're simulating the mechanical structures. So basically we take these physics laws as they are, and then we're expressing these laws and relations in a way that computer can understand it. And once we do so, we can allow computer to solve the problem for us. 
that's the beauty of the simulation. So this is not painful, like let me think about like a dynamic courses, which I'm sure you guys hate big time, because there is those courses need big brains. You need to have, you know, understanding about different relations and relations are different in one from one case to another. Here we have nothing like that. We just follow the certain steps, steps. And once we follow these steps, we can get the equation of motion automatically. And then uh, once we have the equation of motion, then we will simply say to the computer that go ahead and solve it to me. That's it. That's the principle. Details, less pleasant. So the details look like this bad. So once we say in computer that, okay, go ahead and solve the equation of motion, that means that the equation of motion need to be in a form that equates, uh, that computer can understand it. Now that comes with a certain difficulties because the computers, at least the, the ones that I currently use, they cannot really explain, I mean, they understand my, my, my talking and say, okay, why don't you simulate uh, the four bar mechanism? No way. So the, the way that I can communicate with the computers is that I need to express my equation of motion by having this matrix and vector representation. And that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to express the equation of motion by using the vectors and matrices. This, by the way, this equation is roughly the same than this one here, which is a Newton's second law saying that externally applied forces are equal than inertial forces. This equation here explains the same story, but in language of computers. Okay, that's how it goes. Then uh, what the simulation means, why? Well, my interpretation is this. Simulation is accelerated learning process. And here comes something that is extremely important. So it's not here to replace your thinking, but it's helping you to learn faster. That's what it is. That's why the brains are needed even if you're using simulation extensively. Remember the story about the, this medical condition of uh, simulation disease. You know, that means that you're just simulating and you don't have any learning of you know, any of the things. So that's that's something that is a risk. So uh, learning, what that means. So let me show you an example. So here, oh, let me see, why is this, uh, what? Why is it playing this? Is this something? No, right, so I need to play this right after. Oh, that's a reason. Okay, now it comes. My, this is so slow today. Nothing seems to happen. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna run this right after the break then. Or, or maybe I can run it using this link. You know, this is a good example about the learning process and this time the learning is not about um, human to learn anything, but it's an artificial intelligence that is learning to control the excavator. And here's the video for you. Let me just uh, uh, do this. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, now there's a commercial. Sorry about that. I'm going to skip the commercial. So I have here a physical representation of an excavator. I'm uh, allowing artificial intelligence to control this excavator. So this is a one example about the learning process. Uh, the excavator slowly is capable to grab the dirt from the crown and move that dirt to uh, this industrial hopper. So an example about the learning process. So, uh, by the way, this is something, this, uh, this channel is another channel that you may want to subscribe. So, there's a LUT, Computational Mechanics. And there are other videos similar than this one available. Look at this, I got one thumb up. Not bad, not bad. Okay, back to my lectures. And uh, now I got confused, like, where is my mouse now? Here. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, so how to build simulation models? We could use a technique that is called multi-body system dynamics. And uh, that's the one that I mentioned earlier. So it's like this beautiful method that we just follow the certain steps 
and equation of motion comes automatically. No thinking needed. So a beautiful method. And uh, it can be applied to a wide variety of applications, including biomechanics. So here's an example about the human uh, simple exercise. And here we are measuring the how is a bone strengthening process. Bone strengthening process is a function of the bone strains and stresses. So that's why the certain bones are modeled as a flexible bodies. Are we looking like how this pedaling or is this skiing system? I guess that this is pedaling system. How that is affecting the, your bone health? Good example about the, what simulation can do for you. Because otherwise measuring these quantities, not possible. Or let me say not possible in the Western countries. Let me put it this way. Because it's possible in theory that you can attach the strain gates to your bone. But that's going to be a painful, painful process. And for sure you don't want to do it. I'm sure you prefer to use simulation instead. Okay, one more thing. Real-time simulation, a little bit about how that works. So this is a um, real-time simulation of a harvester structure. You learn how to use it, and not just to learn it, but you know, uh, people can learn like what are the desires of customers that we can have. We can use this in a number of different ways, which I will get back to that sometimes after 12 weeks or so. But prior to that, we're gonna take a look at the theory, like. What are the things that makes it possible to build the simulation models like the one you can see it here? But you can see this is where it all goes. It takes an effort to do it, but definitely doable. All right, as summary, simulation is a shortcut to better products and services. Services too, so it can be used in, a, in service business and offering some new services to customers. It helps to understand the customer needs so if you can use a real-time simulation, we can try a different concept and ask like, how you like it? Is this, would, would this be something that you could consider the purchase or not at all? It's certain, it uh, makes product development to be faster, improves the product quality and performance, makes product to be more reliable. And many others, which I will get back to you after you know all these theoretical discussions. Okay, with that, Mathematics. And now comes the, well, one more slide and then this, this break that I promised. So if you are not comfortable with the mathematics that I'm showing in the lecture notes, which, you know, basically is um, matrix operations, vector operation, if, if you're feeling shy or if you're shy in those matters, take a look at that one link that is available in the Moodle database and check the background from the Khan's Academy. Khan's Academy is a great website and really helps you to understand what's the mathematical foundation of this course. With that, we're done with the background. We're done with the background and we're gonna get started with the real deal. That's description of rigid bodies. But again, one more thing, like I mentioned earlier, things are getting progressively more difficult. So don't skip the lectures. You know, you guys um, don't understand that, okay, I need to make a drawing here, so it goes like this. This y-axis here is a level of difficulty. This axis here is a time here. We're getting started here. This is the first lecture, second, third, and so on and so forth. We're getting started here. It's very, very easy. But suddenly things getting more and more difficult. Somewhere around here, there's a high peak. Like seriously high peak, because you can't, I cannot even draw that because it's so high. And then we're coming back here. But it's increasing all the time. So that's what's going to follow next. But let's have that five minutes break. So it's going to be uh, 5.15. Then I will be back. I'm not going to cut this streaming because it's going to cause me some kind of technical difficulties. So I'm going to simply mute myself and I will be back in... Uh, Five minutes. Something weird happened just uh, <clears throat> a minute ago because um, you know, I'm I'm sitting in my university office, but I got like uh, some kind of um, problem in my internet connection, which is uh, surprising. As here in the university, it should be strong, healthy connection all the time, but I don't know. Okay. Not that I'm uh, 
reconnect it again so it looks okay so let me just double check that by you checking my um uh, hold on hold on <clears throat> YouTube here. Tronic. Okay, so I'm not sure where can I see that there's a live. Okay, so I'm good. So let's continue then. So let's move on to um, description of rigid bodies. That's, that's going to be something that is um, already fundamentals of uh, simulation. So look at that. So we did not spend much of a time for background. We are really jumping the real deal almost immediately from the beginning of the course. Okay. So uh, I said earlier that we are using a method called multibody system dynamics. So let me explain you a little bit about what is a multibody system and uh, how is that multibody system dynamics can solve uh, the different systems. And that's what we're going to start looking in details in future. And uh, let me see. So I'm successfully connected again. So it looked that everything is okay. Chat was disconnected, but it, it should be back on again. So I would appreciate if some of you can send me a short uh, confirmation that I'm okay. My voice is okay. My talks are okay. My picture is okay. And I'm looking good. Don't let me know any of this um, stuff, but let me know if you can see my streaming. That that will be enough today. All right, multi-body dynamics, multi-body system. So let's get started by first... Uh, Looking at the multi-body, okay, so it's looking good. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, let's look what is a multi-body system. So, multi-body, as the title implies, multi-body is something that is a system that consists of multiple bodies. So it could be one or more bodies that are moving, and uh, <clears throat> something that in a multi-body dynamics is a very important is that in a multi-body system dynamics, we do not make any assumption regarding the magnitude of rotation. That is a significant difference of this course versus the course that you are previously familiar with. Because if you go and check it out your notes from courses like dynamics and mechanics, you will soon recognize that the most often used assumption is that you are assuming that the rotations are small, meaning that if you have, let's say, a pendulum like my pen, you are assuming that the pendulum is moving like plus minus 10 degrees, roughly that much. And if you have that as that assumption of small rotation, then you can easily linearize your equation of motion. And if you linearize your equation of motion, you can even find an analytical solution to solve your equation of motion. In multi-body system dynamics, we don't make this kind of assumption. We simply don't. So when we are looking at the pendulum, the pendulum can be the one that is getting started here, going all the way to here. And this is large rotation, which leads to nonlinear expression of equation of motion. And when you have nonlinear equation of motion, you do not have analytical solutions available, at least in a general case. You might have it in a very simple cases, but generally the, the systems we are about to discuss you don't have an analytical solution available. So what you need to do then is that you need to solve equation of motion by using numerical integration procedure, where you're expressing first acceleration. And then from acceleration, you are integrating velocity. And from velocity, you're integrating the position. That's how it goes. So large rotation, that's important in a multi-body system dynamics. Another thing that is um, important is that uh, in multi-body system dynamics, the bodies are connected together using joints, motion limitation. 
something that if I'm moving one body in my multi-body system, other bodies have to follow because of the constraints, because of the joints. Crankshaft mechanism is an example. So if I take a hold of this piston body here, and I'm forcing piston body to go left and right, other bodies that are connection rod and crankshaft have to follow accordingly. And that's because of the joints. Revolve joint here, revolve joint here, and revolve joint here. So if I know the position of the piston, I can solve the position of other bodies by using kinematic analysis. This is something that is very fundamental in multi-body system dynamics. So here I have another system, which too consists of multiple bodies. So I have here one, two, three bodies. There is no last rotation, which is uh, no problem. But then what is a problem here? That the bodies are not connected together via joints, but forces, spring forces to be more specific. And these spring forces are a bit problematic because if I um, take a hold of this body here, I'm, I'm pressing this body to go downwards. I cannot solve the position of second and third body by using kinematics because they will move because of the forces, not because of the motion limitations. And that's conceptually big difference. This one here could be solved by using multi-body system dynamics, but it could be solved by using other means of simulation method as well, like a finite summer method would be okay and others too. So you don't need to use multi-body system dynamics by the definition. Out of the two systems, the crankshaft mechanism is a multi-body system. This one here be not a multi-body system. Okay, so system which consists of multiple bodies where there is a motion between the bodies, bodies are connected together via constraints, joints, joints, which introduce the motion from one body to another body. You know, that's the multi-body system. Let me ask you this. Hold on, I need to see my pointer here. What is not the multi-body system? I have here a building, four bar mechanism, excavator, and Elvis as a biomechanical system. So which one out of the four is not a multi-body system? And let me put my soccer div on. So just a second. Uh, Yep, it's on. Okay, not a multi-body system. Check a look at the soccer div and hopefully you are still locked in. Yeah, it looked that you're still locked in. So I have 72 uh, uh, students in my soccer div system. And I got eight answers already, 10, 13, and more is coming. So out of the four, one is not multi-body system. Which one? And again, the choices are building, house, four-bar mechanism, excavator, Elvis, as a biomechanical system. And I got 42 answers already, so let me put this on so you can see how is that you're doing. Game is on. Success rate. And that's, you know, what I do last, usually I do this, um, is that uh, if you guess the success rate correctly, I'm going to give you one extra point. So I need to take a look, like, if there were any correct answers or any correct guesses last time. Last time it was 73, and I got no, no one got that correctly, no one. Okay, what's the success rate this time? 100? Yeah, I like that, I like it. 89, yeah, could be, could be. My personal guess is um, 55, 55. Not because this is not that difficult. It's not difficult at all, but you know, because what I think that happens when you are watching my streaming is that you're having another window open with the, I don't know, YouTube channel better than mine, and you're watching something that you're more, more interested than my thing. And then you suddenly realize that, oh my God, there is a in-class quiz is going on. So let me just guess something. And when you do the guessing, 
you know, your chances to get it correctly are not so great. Okay, so I got quite a bit of uh, answers. So, um, yeah, and the, some of the numbers are good, but I'm thinking myself that it's going to be low number. We'll see. It's getting late and all that. That's that's a part of my my reasoning here. So, uh, here this window here. I could see. Yeah, I think that all of you already entered your answer. So, should we take a look? Guess game is still on. So make your final guesses. And here it goes. Success rate today is very high, very high, 93. 93 is good. 93 is very, very good. So uh, uh, again, there is some someone having difficulties to find uh, the student number. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, somebody was too honest saying that. Yeah, I was in uh, some other website, like more interesting than than this one, and that's why. Uh, uh, or you say not browsing? Definitely not browsing. Sorry, I misread you. Okay, so uh, so did we got anyone correctly? Anyone correctly? Ninety-two. We got ninety-two. That's that's close enough. So let me. 92, I need to write down the, the winner. Nice, good work. And then uh, let me see if there's anyone else. 92 is a winner here, very close. And that's about it. 95. Should we say that 95 is also so uh, close enough? It is. Oh, there it is. There is a 94. There is 94. 94. Good work. And then 95 was this guy here. Okay. So that's that's it. Let's move on. Uh, I need to put this off. I need to scroll myself here and let me continue to my explanations. <clears throat> okay, multibody. That's what we learned. So there is a multibody system that consists of multiple bodies, and these bodies are connected together via joints, different kinds of joints, bevel joint, prismatic joint, and many, many others. So we're going to learn later what are the different opportunities, different options. So, um, so that's that's what it is. One thing that is extremely important that once we look at the one body, let's say that we randomly take the body number two. Body number two is consisting of particles. Here comes something that I would like you to to focus fully to my talk. You know, particles are like ingredients, components of body. Particles same time are something that you cannot see in a real life. They're like mathematical definitions and they are really really tiny dots if you wanted to have a physical interpretation of what is a particle like super tiny dots so tiny that it's not having any physical dimension which is like what not having physical dimension don't worry about that but worry about this you know it's so small that the rotational decrees of freedom makes no difference well that's a good explanation so think about that is like a minor, minor thought, because it's so small, it doesn't really make sense, you know, what rotation or what orientation it is in space. So, so that's particle. And what we're going to do next is that we are looking at how is that these particles can be defined with respect to reference coordinate system. Reference coordinate system is sometimes called as a global coordinate system. That's the one that everything is defined with I mean, every, every single component is defined with respect to this global coordinate system. It gives us a measure, measure to, to see how the bodies and particles are moving. That's what we're going to do next. All right, here it is. I have here a body, body that is potatoes shape, body, body that is called A. And I have here two examples of particle. Here's one particle. Here's second particle and here's third particle. In 
kind of like in a large scale. So the, the particle is even smaller than that. So it's so tiny that you cannot even see that properly. But to, to kind of highlight this thing though, so I make these particles to be a bit bigger, still so small that the rotational decrease of freedom is immaterial, makes no difference. Okay, here's the challenge. So I have here particles, now three of them visible with me. And I want to describe this particle with respect to this coordinate system, which is called global coordinate system. That's where everything is measured with respect with. Okay, now uh, how can I make this happen? Well, I could simply take a vector, measure the one particle here, and the vector, because this is in a planary case, this is in a two-dimensional space, this vector would have two components, Rx, sorry about my handwriting, again, I lost my pen, which, you know, Rx and Ry, which is a projection of this vector with respect to x and y axis. Sure, I can do that. Then I can do the same for the second particle. Again, that's going to be two additional components. There will be four together. And then more fun, you know, one more com particle. I need ad additional two components. That will be six in total, six already. There's only three particles. And there's a lot of particles in a one body. There's actually infinite number of particles in one body. Millions and millions, billions and billions of particles. So obviously this work or this approach, this is not going to fly because I need so many variables, so many vectors to describe all my particles that no computer can handle this. So it's not possible. This shows the hypothetical way to do it. I could have these vectors, but this is no goal. This is not a good way to go. So what is that, that I can do then? So if this is not the way to go, what I can do? Well, I can use the fact that these particles cannot move relatively with respect to each other. And this is simply because I'm assuming my potato-shaped body called A to be rigid, which is not, you can find something in real life, every single particle are, I mean, party is flexible, but I'm here making assumption that I have rigid body, which is okay assumption in most of the cases. And now if this is rigid, then particles cannot move relatively with respect to each other. Okay, that's a good news. That's a good news because then I can use that. And once I, once I, use, that, that, once I use that information, I can actually introduce additional coordinate systems. So I got my, my pointer lost, so it's here. And this additional coordinate system is the one that is called body reference coordinate system. This is nice because now I can use this coordinate system and I can describe every single particle with respect to this body reference coordinate system. And these vectors are constant because particles cannot move relatively with respect to each other. And I can say, okay, this body reference coordinate system is attached to body. So if body translate, so do the body reference coordinate system. And if the body rotates, body reference coordinate system will follow. So it's welded to this potato shaped body. So whatever body is doing, body reference coordinate system will do the same. So that's what we're gonna use. That's what we're gonna use. And that's the way we're gonna define the particles. And here it goes. So we're first defining where the body reference coordinate system is located using this vector here. And then with respect to this coordinate system, we can define the vector U bars. Bar here stands that there is a definition with respect to body reference coordinate system. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. Only problem is that I have now two coordinate system and no relation yet. I have to relate this coordinate system to each other because this one here is in a, in a body reference coordinate system. This one here is in a global coordinate system. And I need to convert this representation to be in this coordinate system. Hmm. How can I make that happen? Well, this says that pretty much what I just explained. You know, I cannot just add up these two vectors. This is not possible. Why it is not possible? 
because this one here is a body reference corner system and this is global corner system. They don't match, they don't match. But I can find a relation between these two coordinate systems. So how can I find this relation? Well, here's what I need to go back to my mathematic courses. And I need to look a little bit about the kinematic notations. And let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. I have here, you know, two coordinate system, global and local. Body reference, global coordinates, those are the same thing. Local coordinate system is the one that is denoted as a bars. This is my global coordinate system. And then I have here one vector, which is vector u bar, this one here. I wanted to see how is a projection of this vector u bar with respect to global coordinate axis. That's my challenge here. Okay, so how can I make it happen? I know that the body reference coordinate system, local coordinate system, if you may, is rotated amount of theta and the vector is uh, rotated with respect to body reference coordinate system amount of alpha a little bit of small font but i hope you see that let me make it a bit no i know i don't want to make it bigger because it's going to mess my things okay so projection in global x-axis is this one here it can be computed in such a way that i will take a length of the vector u bar and I multiply the length by cosine alpha plus theta. Okay. You learned this already in, a, I don't know, junior high school or somewhere, elementary school. This is not that difficult. What about this projection, this y projection? Same. A length of the vector cosine alpha plus theta. All right. Then you need to take something from the high school. Uh, that uh, that you need to take something from the high school is this kinematic relation, all right? So this kinematic relation, you can substitute it here and here, all right? This is how your projection reads after that. Sorry that I'm blocking the view. This is how it reads. Okay, so we're almost there. So uh, I just need to find my, my browser. My, my pointer is here. Okay, then I'm going to use a notation here because I know that the vector u bar, this one here, can be expressed when you, once you know this alpha angle. All right, so I can use that information. I can substitute this information, this, and this information to my equation that this is copy paste from the previous slide. All right, let's substitute it. And once I do that, this is what I'm going to get. You know, again, you know, my aim here is to see the projection in global coordinate system. Finally, when I do this computation and when I take this, when I express or re-express this equation by using matrices and vectors, I can tell that my projection in a global coordinate system can be expressed such the way that there is a two by two matrix, which is called rotation matrix multiplied by component of vector u bar. u bar is a component of this guy here. This is it. This guy, or this character, rotation matrix, relates to coordinate system, local and global. Body reference, again, don't get confused because sometimes I call local coordinate system as a body reference coordinate system, sometimes, sometimes I don't. As a, as a local coordinate system. Those are the same things. Anyways, now I have this relation. This is the mapping from one coordinate system to another coordinate system. Two, two are Cartesian coordinate systems. Later, we're gonna learn more mappings between the different kind of coordinates, but this time it's fairly straightforward. And it is this two by two rotation matrix that is doing the trick for me. This is orthogonal matrix. Meaning that if you look at the, or if you form vectors from these columns, these vectors will be perpendicular with respect to each other, having 90 degrees angle with respect to each other. That's exactly the case in a coordinate system, in Cartesian coordinate system. These vectors are unit in length, these ones. So it's a coordinate system. It tells how the body reference coordinate system is with respect to global coordinate system. 
and it's doing the trick for us. It's converting the vector u bar to be with the u from local to global, local to global. Here's the whole story. You know, now if we're going to take account of that, yes, there is a translation, which is accounted by using this guy here, vector R, capital R. And then I have this mapping matrix that is converting my expression from local to global. I can finally express where is that my particle is located in global coordinate system. This is my particle position in a global coordinate system. And it can be expressed in a very simple way like this. Translation of the body reference coordinate system, rotation of the body reference coordinate system, and with the U-bar. That's what it is. Okay. So, how you feel? Uh, let me see if you're still alive. No, well, you, I don't know about that, but I can see that I have 71 views here. Could be more than that, but that's okay. All right, so uh, let's take a look at an example. Sorry that this is a little bit of small, but um, let me read it to you. So I have here a beam like, um, okay, yeah, you're saying that I'm still surviving. Good. Okay, I have here a beam like body, thin body, such the way that the body reference coordinate system, again, local coordinate system is located in one end of the beam like body. And the length of the body is mentioned, so the length is one meter here. And the body is rotated 90 degrees, as can be seen in this figure. And uh, that's in uh, that's actually P divided by 2. Okay, and my question is that where is this particle that is located in the another end of the beam-like body, where that is located with respect to global coordinate system? Okay, so it's a matter of substitution. No thinking, but substituting things. You know, first of all, you need to account how much the body reference coordinate system is translated. That's offered here in the text. So it's translated two units in a global x direction, one unit in a global y direction. Okay, then I need to take account how much it is rotated. This is actually provided in the text too. So it's, it's rotated p divided by two, amount that is p divided by two. All right. You substitute that information to this rotation matrix, which is here. And the only difficult thing is that you need to figure out what is the U bar, what's the U bar. Okay. To do that, you need to put yourself in a position, which is this one here, origin of the body reference coordinate system. And you need to put yourself in orientation aligned with the body reference coordinate system, local coordinate system. Now, your local coordinate system, the x-axis is pointing upwards, and your y-axis is pointing, well, you know, horizontally to left. Now, how to reach, or how to move from this point to this point with respect to a local coordinate system? Obviously, you need to travel this direction, which is a global x-direction. And how much? Well, that's going to be the length of the body. And it's mentioned here that the length of the body is one meter. So that's what it is. How much you need to move to this direction? Zero. That's why this is going to be zero. You do the substitution. You compute it where it is. And that's the, the final solution is here. Very mechanical. Very, very mechanical. OK. So that's, uh, let me see if I have another example to you. Yeah, I have another example to you. This is a bit different than uh, the previous in a sense that the body reference coordinate system is located in the middle of the beam like body. It can be actually located anywhere you want, even outside of the body. Uh, oh, I got an alarm that the, the question and answer session is about to get started. Okay, let me, let me explain this example to you, and then we will be off. Okay, this time I have a body that is having the length of two meters, and uh, 
The body reference corner system is located here in the middle. The x-axis is pointing this direction, even though that is not clearly visible here. Y-axis is pointing that direction. And I'm asking where this particle that is located this end is with respect to global coordinate system. All right, so what is the information we have? So we know that the body reference coordinate system has translated one unit in a global x direction, one unit in a y direction. So this is what we can directly substitute it here. Especially also that the, the body coordinate system is rotated three multiplied by p divided by four. All right, so that's another information we can substitute it here. Then the question is, what is the vector u bar? Okay, now this time x-axis is pointing this direction. Again, you need to put yourself in this position that is here, this position, and you need to walk from the origin of the body reference coordinate system to particle that we would like to, to study this time. That's the one that is here. How you can make it happen? You need to travel the minus x direction because obviously you need to go this way. How much? That's going to be half the length of the body. Full length is two meters. Half the length is one. So it's minus one. How much you need to travel this direction? That's zero. That's the, your vector u bar. You do the math, and your answer is here. So that's about it. That's the first lecture. This is how we're going to get started. Again, a few things that I would like to uh, remind you. Have that can-do attitude. You can make this happen. This is not going to be too difficult for you. Make sure you're following that Temeco videos. Make sure you're printing out that uh, lecture notes. You keep on reading them. And uh, that's about it. Is there any good source that you can find uh, other material? Yes, uh, lecture notes, handouts, which is in um, which is available in the Moodle site. So, rotation matrix can uh, decrease be used? No, well, decrease we using um, we we don't use the the decrease here. It you know it would be okay, but just to make your life easier, uh, don't use it. Don't use uh, the decrease. Okay, so any other comments, questions? I'm still checking out the, the chat window. If there's no other comments, I'm gonna see you momentarily in a um, team session. To find yourself to team session, take a look at your inbox. And there is a message that I emailed you, I think yesterday or Monday, that came through the Moodle. So there is a link that takes you to a team session. Then you can ask more questions, you can ask things related to practical matters of the course. You can argue against me, whatever you want. Okay, so this is it. I'm going to close the streaming and see you soon in, uh, in tips.